Okay, uh, we are. It is time now to start our second, the second to last talk of PyCon 2023. Um, the talk will be supercharging pipeline efficiency with ML performance prediction with Boaz Wisner and Kerem Maron, and they will be taking questions after the fact. So if you have questions after the presentation is over, please line up at the microphone right here in the center and ask your questions. So please give me a uh, join me in giving a warm round of applause to our three speakers. Thank you, all right. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm sure all of you out there have some data pipeline at work, right? And you've been these days, and then I'm sure most of you have also experienced heavy loads and high queues in your system. Well, today we're going to talk about how we supercharge our pipeline's efficiency using machine learning performance prediction. So, my name is Karen Ravon, I'm a software engineer at Singular. I live in Tel Aviv, and I just got married less than a month ago. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm Boaz Wisner. I'm a DevOps engineer at Singular. I also live in Tel Aviv, and we're doing life events since I had a first born daughter uh, three months ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in order to understand what we're going to talk about today, we need to tell you what Singular does in just a sentence. So our clients are companies with marketing teams who need to pull their marketing data from over a dozen of ad networks and combine that all into one big table in order to view and analyze their marketing data. So at Singular, we do just that. We pull ad campaign insights from over a thousand of ad networks process it through a pipeline which does things such as interpolation and combining of data. And then all this in order to show our clients full knowledge of the marketing efforts and the return on investment or ROI. So each server in our data pipeline consists of dedicated workers which run tasks which are logically grouped. So for example, all tasks pulling or pushing data for a snowflake database are labeled snowflake. And then our workers are salary workers. And for those of you who are not familiar with salary, um, salary is a task view implementation which is used to execute tasks asynchronously. And this we have managed by Kubernetes, which is a container, um, containerized application which is used for automating management, deployment, and sharing of containerized applications. So it's important to note that our clients rely on their data from us on a timely matter. So they come to work at 8 in the morning and they need to view their marketing data on Singular in order to make decisions um, on the current campaigns which they're running. So that means that all the tasks which we're running in our pipeline need to be finished on time, and there can't really be a delay. If there is, if there are any queues in our system, then at 8 in the morning they won't have their data. So what is our problem, and what are we here to talk about in the first place anyway? Well, we did experience queues in our system, and when we investigated those queues, we saw something interesting. We noticed that 90% of our tasks are light tasks in terms of duration and required memory, and only 10% are heavy tasks. This means that shorter tasks were getting stuck in the queue behind the longer tasks, and then the smaller clients were being affected by bigger clients because their tasks would have otherwise finished on time and they wouldn't have had a day to do it. So we started thinking how we would solve this issue, and the first thing we did, actually, was to manually scale our workers. The problem with that is that it's very expensive, it increases our cloud spend, and it's really not a scalable and sustainable solution because we'd have to have our engineers scaling the workers up and down all the time because we don't really want to have an infinite amount of workers um, all the time. So really is not a good long-term solution. The next thing we thought of doing is splitting our tasks into smaller tasks, which is a great design solution, but also here, we realized that some of the tasks are already pretty small um, in terms of what we can do. For example, if we have a task pulling data from Facebook API for a certain time range, then we're already pulling for one day, which is the minimum amount allowed, and there's nothing much more we can do here. So we finally realized what we really need to do and what would help us is have better resource management. We need to be able to split up, split up our tasks between the light tasks and the heavy tasks in order to then better optimize each one of these groups according to their properties. So, for example, one of the things which we could do is auto scaling, and we'll talk more about that later on. Okay, but how will we do this? So how will we differentiate between the light tasks and the heavy tasks? 
Well, you can tell me what's the problem. Let's just create some static function, which given some task will tag it as light or heavy. And then obviously the task will have some input parameters. We can take those into account, create some decisions. Well, that's not so simple because obviously we could have a very long list of parameters, making it quite harder. But also some of these parameters have a very high um, cardinality and variance, meaning that a lot of possible values which would which could go in, making that decision tree very low and quite impossible to, to do. Another thing which makes this kind of hard to do is that we chain together tasks so that the two tasks are running together and the output of one task will be the input to the next task. So that means that's something which only happens during runtime and we can't possibly know how to statically know that ahead of time. And obviously, you know, obviously, but the out the input to the task will have very significant effects on how long it's going to run. So then how will we solve this classification problem after all? Well we did decide to use machine learning. So we played around with different models to see which one gave us the best results. And in fact it was a fairly simple model. We used the sort vector regression as the model, which is a supervised learning algorithm which is used to predict discrete values. And what it does is try to find the hyperplane in an in-dimensional space which matches the natural number of data points. So the pros of the SDR are that it's robust to outliers, it's very effective in high dimension, and it's fairly easy to implement, and this is very important since we're trying to actually productionize the model and not just only use it in research. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, the cons of the SDR are that it's not very suitable for large data sets because it has fairly high training time, and it doesn't perform well with noise. So noise in our case would be, for example, a bug in the code which obviously is something which we need to not have very often, and when it does happen, not exist for a very long time. So that's why we're okay with that. Here you can see how we set up our model configuration. So this is one task, for example. We set this up for each task which we want to be able to differentiate between the light and the heavy task. So this is a straight customer task which pulls data from third-party networks. And you can see we set up the parameters for the task, the kernel C down on Epsilon, which is played around teaching it or training our model, the features, which are a number of days and number of accounts, and ID parameter names, which is custom ID. So this means that we train the model per customer. Now we did start out trying to train one big model for all the customers together, but that gave us not so good results because you can see how each customer's data would be very different from each other. And then uh, getting, that's the reason why we do not get good results. Um, and therefore, we still have the model per customer. So how did we choose our model, our features? Well, we started out with the longest of possible parameters for the class. And here's an example of some of them. And then played around with different combinations, feeding them to our model, training it, training it give us the best results, and we did get the number of days and number of accounts. And since we're pulling uh, data of customers, then we can see how that would have an immediate effect on the amount of data pulled and how much time it would take to process it. So we did productionize the model, trained it for some time, and then use it in our pipeline. But then after a while, we were starting to see not so good results, and we had to investigate what was happening, what did we forget? And we found out that we did forget about something called an account. So what is an account? Really big clients have a lot of apps, so what they do is they split up these apps between accounts. So each account is responsible for a certain number of apps. And then at similar, we do something similar. Instead of pulling data, all of the clients data on one task, we would pull data for a certain number of accounts. So not only will the number of accounts change per task, which is why we have the feature of the number of accounts, but also the combination of accounts will change. And some accounts can be really big, but some can be really small. So that is why if we just take into account the number of accounts, then if it's two accounts, but sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small, we're not going to get good results. So we were thinking, okay, how will we use the actual account as a feature to our model and not only the number of accounts? The first thing we started doing is using all permutations of the account ID. The problem with, with this is that the account ID is a number, but it has no numerical significance. So if you're using a number, the model will probably treat it as a number. Uh, therefore, getting really not, not so good results. Um, so next, we tried to do something smarter. 
Besides the savings and account, the total size of an account, meaning how much spend is allocated to this account by the client. The problem, the problem with this is that we could have one row of data with a total spend of $1,000, or we could also have 1,000 rows of data with a total spend of $10. And if we're doing operations such as aggregations and et cetera on the data, it's going to take more time to process 1,000 rows of data. So finally, we realized what we really need to do is know the expected row count, which we're going to pull for that account. But since we're pulling from third party networks, we can't really know what, how much data we're going to pull. I mean, if we're a fortune teller, that might work, but we're not. So what we did is look into our database and see how much data we pulled for those accounts in previous days. And then use that as the feature for a model. And we did do that, and we were getting the same amount, and we were getting good results again. So that was great. So now Buzz will tell us a bit more about how we productionized the model, and then how did we actually use this differentiation between light and heavy tasks in order to improve our Python efficiency. Cool. Hey, everyone. That's uh, Buzz, the top guy here. Um, and so the first thing that's most important with productionizing the model is that we can't have the model's decision take really any amount of time at all. Because uh, in that case, uh, we're just slowing down all of our tasks. So that means our entire training architecture and infrastructure has to happen, you know, be passed or asynchronously from, from the decision process. Uh, and it looks a bit like this. Um, I hope it's not too scary of a graph, but we're going to break it down step by step. So the first thing that happens at the end of every celery task, we have something called a task info collector. Um, and this is some custom code that we wrote that collects the relevant metadata for each task. Uh, things like the duration or memory, uh, which is what we actually want to use to train with. Um, it then takes that metadata and puts it into S3, which is AWS's object storage. Uh, AWS also has a neat tool called uh, Athena, which allows you to use SQL queries and run SQL queries over data sitting in S3. And we'll utilize that uh, actually right now in kind of the meat and potatoes of this whole infrastructure, the performance predictor train runner. This is a celery task that we run periodically, uh, once a day, for each customer, and it is responsible for actually creating and recreating the model. And the way that it works is, is as such. First, it queries um, S3 using Athena, gathers the data for the past day, and uh, builds a data set out of it. It then takes the existing model and takes the new data and trains and retrains the, the model to have all the updated information. So in this way, if something changes or something would become heavier instead of light, then it would pick up on this since we run this task periodically. Now, finally, once the performance strictly train runner is done, it saves uh, the entire model into a Redis database. Now, since the model is for customer, uh, then the serialized model can be pretty small and actually fit into the value of, of, of Redis. Uh, so we just have a key being the customer ID and the value just being the entire serialized model. Now, the last piece of the puzzle is the Celery Router. Um, the Celery Router is a bit of Celery code that uh, runs every time that a new task is received and it tries to decide to which queue to send the Celery task. And we wrote some custom code there that all it does is it gets the task, it uh, takes the customer ID from the task, gets the model from Redis, and uh, runs the task parameters through the model and makes the decision based on the output of the model. Uh, should it be a light class that is light or heavy? And then it sends it to the light queue or the heavy queue, which have dedicated workers uh, consuming from them. Now, finally, for all of this to kick, we need to monitor our model predictions and make sure they stay accurate. Uh, so we compare the predicted duration of memory with the actual duration of memory using RMSC or root mean square error. If the error levels get too high, uh, we're alerted and we dive in to investigate. So, I mean, it works, right? We have uh, split our tasks into light and heavy queues. Uh, we have dedicated celery workers for each type of queue. And in that way, uh, we solve our problem snowballing task build up and data delay for our customers. Um, so that's great. And we decided that we could start looking a bit more to the future and start talking maybe a bit about auto scaling. 
So auto scaling in general is the ability to increase and decrease capacity based on real time parameters. So uh, in an example of classical auto scaling, if I had a bunch of web servers behind a load balancer uh, and my web server was running hot and were under load, then auto scaling would just automatically spit out a few more web servers to handle the load. And that would be that. Uh, in Celery, uh, we need to scale the number of workers up and down. And so those are the things that are actually consuming from the queue and doing the actual work. Now, why even bother with auto scaling? Well, aside from the fact that I'm a DevOps guy and just saying the word auto scaling makes my heart happy, um, it has actual legit reasons. So, first of all, it reduces queues. Uh, in times of you know heavy load and the queues go up, then it'll automatically scale and bring up more workers to bring the queues down quicker. Uh, additionally, it has increased multi-tenancy and resource utilization, so I can take two jobs and run them on the same underlying infrastructure, and I can expect one job to start working really hard at one point while the other one isn't, and then, you know, vice versa. The other one will work really hard while the first one isn't, but they can both run on the same underlying infrastructure without bothering each other. And all scaling lets you do that really efficiently. And finally, there's no manual intervention necessary. I mean, we've all been there. Middle of the night, the keys are high, you get paid, you wake up at 3 a.m., you put the plus button, terrible, uh, all the scaling solves it, and then everyone's happier. Uh, happy engineer thinks happier product. Um, okay, so auto scaling in Kubernetes and Celery is a little bit different than classical auto scaling. First of all, we have to scale based on the two length metric. That's what determines the load of our system, not necessarily the CPU or memory of the underlying infrastructure. Um, Secondly, uh, it's only cost-effective for short tasks. Now, in our data pipeline, we have an axiom that we don't want to interrupt long-running tasks. If a task takes one, two, or three hours to run, then we wouldn't want to kill it in order to scale down, because then we lose those, you know, two or three hours of work, and now it's done. So, um, all this game only would work for short tasks. But since we now split into light and heavy tasks, and 90% of our pipeline is light, then hey, we can like auto scale 90% of our pipeline, which is pretty awesome. Now, let's take a quick look at the architecture needed to auto scale Celery on Kubernetes. Now, the most important component is the horizontal pod auto scaler. It's responsible for automatically adding and removing pods. In our environment, one pod or container is one Celery worker, which is consuming tasks from the queue. Now, as I mentioned, we want to scale based on queue length. The key link with all of our metrics is stored in Datadog, a SaaS modeling solution. We provide the Datadog cluster agent, which fetches the key link from Datadog and exposes it to Kubernetes through the Datadog metric CRD, or custom resource definition. Uh, CRDs are the Kubernetes way to expose external data through the Kubernetes API. Now, then all we need to do is attach, attach the horizontal pod autoscaler to that CRD, and it will begin autoscaling based on the key link metric. The last piece of the puzzle is the cluster autoscaler. If the horizontal pod autoscaler adds too many pods and there's not enough underlying capacity to run them, the cluster autoscaler catches this and scales up a new AWS instance to run on. And just like that, everything works. This is the actual metric used by autoscaler. Um, those who are sharp of eye will notice that it's a moving rollup. Uh, this is because the links tend to be very spiky and they go up and down a lot. And uh, that would make the auto scaler go up and down a lot and kind of work a bit unpredictably. So moving things out with like a rolling average window uh, makes everything work more predictably. Uh, and at the bottom, you see the number of running pods. And there's a very clear correlation here, right? The number uh, the key goes up, the number of running pods goes up, key goes down, number of running pods goes down. Another really interesting thing to note here is that the key has to go up first before the number of running pods goes up. Um, this is, it means it's like it's inherently reactive, and it's kind of a constraint of, uh, that's built into scaling based on two length, um, but it does work, and it's pretty effective. And last, but definitely not least, for maybe some of the people in the crowd here, uh, cost optimization. So, uh, AWS actually has these things called spot instances, which are essentially spare compute capacity that they offer at a fraction of the cost. Uh, with the one added caveat that they can interrupt your instance within a three or four minutes notice. Um, but now, since we've uh, split our tasks into light and heavy, and we have short jobs that are running on auto scaling servers and are self healing, then we don't care if the underlying instance dies because our infrastructure will just handle it. So we can utilize spot instances and really cut down on our cloud costs. So we've kind of been through a lot today, so let's take it from the top and summarize quickly. 
We had huge and resource intensive causing issues in production. We had heavy tasks that were holding up light tasks and causing data delays for our customers. We used machine learning to predict the task performance and then send the task to dedicated workers based on if it was expected to be a light task or a heavy task. And finally, we were able to auto scale our light tasks with uh, Kubernetes, um, thus auto scaling about 90% of our pipeline and uh, just making everything work more efficiently, better resource utilization, uh, less waking up at night, and all the wonderful things. So, what does the future hold? Well, uh, at one thing that we could do is we could implement some kind of auto scaling predictor based on two links patterns. Our queues tend to follow patterns throughout the day, and so that holds true for many people. Uh, and we could solve that problem of reactivity I mentioned earlier by by knowing to predict when these spikes are and then scaling in advance. So implementing that could, could help with that, which is pretty cool. And secondly, we think that the concept of machine learning based routing and celery uh, could be really useful for people. So um, honestly, reach out to us and we may even you know, generalize it and release it of some sort. Uh, but it's just generally a really cool concept and I think it could be widely applicable. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, our mails are up there if you too shy to ask any questions. Um, but we're here and we're going to answer any questions you have. So, again, thank you so much. I guess I just had a clarifying question about your usage of spot instances. You said you've got a three to four minute uh, notification that you're going to lose that instance. Are your jobs usually uh, shorter than that? Do you expect them to complete? Or are they so short that it doesn't matter if they're killed and have to start over? Yeah, they're so short, and then we just don't care. Um, it, it's really that's the case. Uh, we do also make sure we do have like alerts on on if um, something goes wrong, then we'll see if um, if our tasks start taking um, if some if our tasks that are taking too long that are running on, on our spot instances, then then we'll see and we'll notice and we'll you know fix things, right? But they're usually too short. Are you using Terraform or other infrastructure as code to create these? Um, so we use uh, COP, uh, which is a uh, Kubernetes uh, operator, like we deploy things to Kubernetes using configuration. Um, that's what we use to provision this infrastructure mostly. It allows you to just pass parameters saying, this, these are spot instances, use these spot instances, run them like this, uh, and all the other you know, servers. Uh, a question is how often do we actually the classification model? Do we actually like daily or like? Yeah. So the training we actually do like once a day, we run and we train the model on the certain tasks which have run now on the on the previous day, and then like we run it on all the tasks which have run on the previous day, and then the routing is done for each task. So a task is created. And then it's in here once it reaches the, it reaches the router, which we have um, implemented the router facility, which does also other uh, has other logic for routing it. So then on that router, we will check, um, actually use the model for each single task and then dedicate it for the previous configuration. Hi. Um, as you were developing this, did you have issues with um, things that you, like when you cover the spot and if they go down? How do you check to make sure that you haven't run something through your queue twice, or is it okay if something gets rerun? And how did you kind of deal with like any errors that happen in this pipeline along the way? Yeah. So um, the task which we have um, in this specific pipeline, it is okay that if they're run more than once, we have um, a recovery system and uh, duplications, which makes sure that it's okay. And that's why we don't care like, if the task is killed. It's okay if it's run again. Yeah. So you mentioned that you have monitoring in place to kind of like monitor the models or like drifting or something. Um, how often have you been like notified about a late and how often have you had to kind of like adjust something since you've deployed this? Yeah, so so usually, uh, so the answer is almost not at all. Um, it all works pretty automatically. Uh, and that's because since we retrain, um, since we retrain the model every day, then, you, you know, we expect it to, if something really does start to skew, then, then the model will will get that metadata, retrain the existing model with that new metadata, uh, and and then it'll already just start splitting it correctly. So, so it doesn't really happen. Yeah, and mostly, and um, when we choose a new task, if we want to, I want to also train because we don't 
have all of our tasks in the model. We like add each one at a time when we think that it needs the optimization. So then at first, obviously, the error is higher, and then we have like two things, like for example, with the account or on the And once we sort that out, then it's easy. Yeah, we have like a training period, a pre training period where we just train the model and don't split. Like we don't send it to, like we have a new task and we want to just train and gather data. So we just do that first and train the model without actually sending it to separate queues. Um, and then we, and then we can like enable with like the feature flags and okay, now I actually start splitting the three tasks. Okay. Good question. Um, okay, so thank you again. Uh, it's been great. Okay.